Okay, so it's one o'clock. Um, we have a good amount of participants have logged on already, so we'll get started. Uh, so I'm Megan Wright, I'm today's host, and I'm the Marketing Associate at Gerber Nutrition. Uh, so quick intro to who we have on the webinar today. Um, so from Grober, we have myself and uh, one of our young animal specialists, Vanessa Riddell. Uh, Vanessa lives on a dairy farm, so she's very also very knowledgeable in calf health. Um, so she'll be on to help moderate the Q&A portion and can also answer question, any questions you may have at the end about uh, Grober products specifically. Uh, so a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A box. So on your control panel um, on your screen, you'll see a little Q&A with chat bubbles. Um, just click on that and type any questions you have into there. Feel free to type questions in as Kristen's presenting. Um, and we'll get all, get to all of them at the end. So with that, I'll pass it over to Vanessa. Thanks, Megan. Hello, everyone. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Kristen Edwards from Tavistock Veterinarians. Kristen received her undergraduate degree in zoology from the University of Guelph and earned her doctorate in veterinary medicine from the Ontario's Veterinary College in 2014. Upon graduation, she joined the Perry Veterinary Clinic in Perry, New York, a large predominantly dairy practice with 26 veterinarians on their team. Wanting to be closer to family, Kristen returned to Ontario to practice dairy production medicine and joined Tavistock in 2016. Her professional interests include dairy nutrition, calf health, reproduction, and dairy economics. Kristen has developed a calf health program for Tavistock veterinarians to reduce disease and mortality while enhancing long-term production through optimized calf rearing. In her spare time, Kristen enjoys snowboarding, hiking, and going on canoe trips with her husband, Sean. Kristen, I will now pass it off to you. Great, thanks Vanessa. And uh, thank you for inviting me to um, be here today. Really looking forward to today's discussion on calf health and diseases. So with that, I will begin my presentation. So um, before I get started, I just wanted to give a brief overview of what you can expect from the presentation today and what I hope that everyone will get out of it. So first, I will be discussing different disease risk factors, um, as well as providing some strategies on how to maximize calf health in order to minimize disease. And then lastly, I'll be going into some of the specific pathogens that our pre-weaned calves um, are faced with. Um, that caused the most disease. So when it comes to disease, um, it really is uh, a balance between the calf's immune system, the pathogen load that they're faced with, and then the calf's environment. So in order to minimize disease, we really need to focus uh, on these three aspects. So the host and specifically trying to maximize our host defenses, the pathogen, um, trying to minimize the load and the opportunity for those pathogens to create disease. And then lastly, the environment and really trying to optimize the environment in which the calves live. So when it comes to minimizing disease, there are really three critical control points and it comes down to focusing on colostrum, nutrition and environment. So in discussing the first uh, critical control point, colostrum, um, I think as an industry, we've certainly talked a lot about it. And I definitely don't want this to just be your typical colostrum talk. Um, that being said, farms that really succeed in rearing healthy, um, well-developed heifers, they really just do the basics well. And at the end of the day, that comes down to focusing on colostrum, nutrition, and environment. So today with colostrum, um, I'm going to share a couple studies with you that really demonstrate the importance of and some of the consequences of poor colostrum management. 
So poor colostrum management leading to failure of passive transfer is a huge disease risk factor. Um, specifically, calves with failure of passive transfer are at a one and a half increased risk for developing scours, one and three quarter increased risk for pneumonia, and then a two times risk for increased death. So when it comes to colostrum, um, we often focus on the immune support that it provides to the calf. So when the calf is born, they're really born with um, just an, uh, an innate immune system, which is um, a variety of generalized killing cells that don't really have any targeted um, pathogen specific killing. That is something that they receive from their mom through the colostrum. And that sort of provides a temporary immune system until the calf is better able to develop its own acquired immune system. So of course, colostrum also provides um, nutrients. And also very interestingly that we've really started to focus on, I would say in the last, you know, especially five years is all the other stuff that's in colostrum and the benefits that that can provide. So it also provides growth factors um, and other bioactive molecules that um, influence the gut and its development. So specifically, we're getting a larger surface area with those crypts and villi um, in the gut. So we have a larger area to digest and absorb nutrients, but also there's an enhanced protein synthesis, um, which also relates to a higher enzyme secretion and expression, again, um, for greater digestion capacity. So keeping in mind um, all the additional growth factors and bioactive molecules that we've realized influence the gut, I think that uh, provides some of the why to the findings of the um, studies that I'm gonna share with you. So when it comes to colostrum, one of the interesting things um, that was found in an unpublished study in 2009, was that calves who received good quality colostrum were better able to use the added nutrients in the intensified milk feeding programs. So what happened in the study was they um, separated calves into two feeding groups, either the control, which was a lower plane of nutrition um, or the intensified. And then within those two groups, they then also um, stratified calves into either receiving poor quality colostrum or, or good quality colostrum um, in terms of IgG load. So what was interesting was that calves who were fed the lower plane of nutrition, the average daily gain didn't really seem to change between uh, whether they were receiving um, a high quality or a low quality colostrum. But when you look to the calves that were fed the more intensified program, it was really interesting because there was a significant um, difference there in terms of the average daily gains um, in that the calves with the better colostrum were better able to use the nutrients from the intensified milk feeding programs. So we know colostrum certainly affects the pre-weaned calf um, just in terms of disease, mortality, um, and then being able to use the nutrients and uh, transition that into growth. But colostrum also has long-term consequences as well. So in a 2005 study, um, they looked at feeding an insufficient amount of colostrum, so two liters versus a sufficient amount at four liters to brown Swiss calves. And what they found was that um, calves that were fed the sufficient amount of colostrum had better rates of gain. Um, they were able to be bred sooner, which makes sense if we're getting larger frame on them sooner, we can breed them sooner. Um, and then it also impacted survival through second lactation as well as the milk yield through second lactation. And that's not surprising. Um, we've certainly seen a lot of studies over the years coming through about milk yields um, and pre-weaning average daily gain. This study looked at the uh, pre-pubertal, but we know even from other studies, looking at every kilo of increased pre-weaning average daily gain, we're seeing that um, in first lactation at about 850 kilos of additional milk. So I would be remiss if I just totally skipped over the five cues of colostrum. Um, I am not going to go into great detail about them. However, I will provide my slides to Vanessa. So um, everyone is welcome to review this in case they 
do need a refresher, but I, uh, I think we've seen a lot of this through a lot of the colostrum talks, and that's not to say that it's not important, it is, um, but I'd like to focus on um, some other things. However, the one thing I will focus on in the five cues is actually the, um, the quantify there. So that is when we take blood from calves, so usually around one to seven days old, and we're looking at the serum total proteins. Um, for a proxy on how well our colostrum management is working. And so the reason I want to draw your attention to that is because in the last year, um, we've updated what the thresholds are. So traditionally, we used to talk about the five and a half and the 5.2 gram per deciliter thresholds, where we wanted to see at least 90% of calves with 5.2 and above, and 80% of calves at five and a half and above. Um, so that has since changed in the last year, where now we're looking for 40% of calves or more uh, to be at the 6.2 and greater threshold, and then having about 30 calves that are in the 5.8 to 6.1 uh, gram per deciliter total protein, and then really trying to minimize uh, the proportion of calves that are below that 5.8. So the next uh, two slides that I'll, that I'll share with you are actually from calves that were uh, enrolled in our calf health program. And so this is data from 2020. And I thought it was really interesting. I mean, it is fairly proof of concept. Uh, we see this in the literature, but it was really interesting to see it in our own calves, uh, in our own backyard. So looking at the effect that serum total proteins have on mortality, um, when we looked at calves that were five point, or sorry, under 5.5, we were having a mortality rate of about 10%. And that um, consistently decreased as we increased our serum total proteins. And for calves that were between six and a half and seven, we'd reduced the mortality down to 2%. So this was really interesting to see. And I think it also fits really nicely with the updated guidelines on what we wanna see for serum total proteins. So it wasn't just mortality that was changed by um, having adequate serum total proteins in our calves. Um, and again, this data is off of 747 calves, but also um, how that impacted lung scores. So the lung scores are based on zero to five and I've stratified it into score three or greater or um, a score below three. And that's just because the literature suggests that three and above is where we start to see milk loss um, and about 525 kilos in first lactation of lost milk production. So again, similar trend, um, as serum total proteins increased, we um, decreased the proportion of calves with lung scores of three or greater. So again, it was just really interesting to see it kind of in our own backyard outside of you know, tightly controlled university studies. So the second uh, pillar to um, the three critical control points is nutrition. So when we talk about nutrition from um, a disease standpoint, our goal is really to try and maximize the immune system so that pathogen challenges and environmental challenges are really minimized. So the next two studies that I'm going to share um, are just a demonstration on how feeding a high plane of nutrition, which um, our current recommendations are about eight to 12 liters per day, how that can impact um, and specifically decrease illness and mortality um, by just having the adequate calories to support the immune system. So one study that uh, was performed in 2012 by Dr. Olivet was um, the impact of nutrition on scours. So what she did was she um, experimentally infected calves uh, on day three of life with cryptosporidium and then stratified them into two different feeding strategies. So one had um, a control in terms of a, a lower milk feeding volume and then one that she categorized as being an intensified milk feeding program. And despite having an equal amount of crypto uh, infected in each of the calves, not only did the calves on uh, the higher plane of nutrition have faster fecal score improvement, 
but they actually continued to gain weight um, despite being infected with crypto, whereas the ones on the lower um, nutrition plane lost weight. Um, and then again, feed efficiency was also much better in the calves um, feeding the intensified milk feeding program. So um, looking at pneumonia, there was a more recent study done um, in 2019 that compared calves that were under 21 days of age that were fed either four liters or six to eight liters per day. So six to eight liters per day is still below um, what we recommend for uh, optimal calf growth and health. Um, but even just this slight increase, they saw a decrease in pneumonia by 92% just by feeding more. So we'll draw your attention to um, these updated, I mean, they don't feel fairly updated right now because that was back in 2005, but it is updated from the 2001 NRC. Um, but these are the updated nutrient requirements of a 100 pound calf under thermoneutral conditions. So that's a key term in this. So for a thermoneutral condition, calves that are um, newborn to three weeks, they have a much narrower range. So for them, um, their thermoneutral zone, meaning that they're not expending any energy to keep cool or keep warm, is about 10 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius. Um, and then once calves are older than three weeks, it's a little bit wider at about zero degrees Celsius to 25. So what I wanted to just draw your attention to is that we know for a calf to at least double its birth weight by the time of weaning, um, we need a growth rate of 0 0.8 kilos per day. Um, so in red, I have the kilo per day conversions from the pounds. Um, and in order to achieve that, again, under thermoneutral conditions, we really need to be getting 900 grams of dry matter into those calves. So of course, cold temperatures. We know that calves are going to require more energy during cold temperatures because they're expending additional energy trying to keep warm. So in order for them to meet their maintenance, but also still continue to grow, we're going to have to feed them more energy. And there are um, a variety of different ways that we can achieve this. We can either increase the solids content um, of the milk, we can increase the number of times that we're feeding them, or we can increase the volume at a single feeding. Um, this is our least desired strategy. So we really try and focus um, just in terms of increasing total, total solids content um, or the number of times fed. So a variety of management strategies to achieve that is increasing the total solids to about 15% if you're not already feeding this year round. Um, and what's important is that as you're increasing from a normal total solids, which is about 12 and a half percent, you're really doing this gradually and only increasing about 1% per day so that we don't create an osmotic scours in the calves. Um, feeding a higher fat milk replacer, if you are feeding a milk replacer is an additional strategy. Of course, feeding more frequently. So if you're a 2X, adding in a third feeding um, or even more if possible. And then making sure the milk that we're feeding is warm. So 40 degrees Celsius just so the calves don't have to expend energy to try and warm the milk once it's in their guts. And then lastly, um, when it comes to winter, trying to push the evening feeding a little bit later, just to allow the calves to keep warmer overnight when we know the temperatures are lowest, um, that way they have a belly full of nice warm milk. So when it comes to warm temperatures, um, we often forget that calves also expend energy trying to cool themselves. And because of that, um, their energy demands increase and a, at about 20 to 30%, which is similar to winter. But one of the unique challenges that comes with summer is that their appetite actually decreases. So a bit of a unique um, feeding strategy is that they need more energy but because we also want to make sure that they're having a large volume of total fluids, um, one of the strategies is trying to keep the total solids in and around the regular 12.5%, um, but trying to increase the energy by offering 
um, more milk through additional feedings. Um, and of course, one of the other important things to remember in the warm temperatures is making sure that water is clean and available at all times since um, their water consumption greatly increases as heat stress increases as well. So one of the forgotten but very important parts of nutrition is consistency. So calves like and really need consistency. And what I mean by that is feeding at the same time every day, trying to minimize the total solids fluctuation. So again, we don't really wanna vary more than plus or minus 1% per day. And then making sure that we have the same number of feedings every day. So when it comes to what you're gonna feed the calves, um, you're either gonna be feeding your calves whole milk or milk replacer. So if you are opting for whole milk, um, there are com some considerations um, and things to remember. And one of them is that there are day-to-day -day fluctuations in terms of bulk tank components. And again, we know that calves like consistency. So trying to not have more than 1% variation is really important. And so one of the recommendations is to test the milk that you're gonna be feeding uh, with a Brix refractometer and adjust using um, a balancer if required. So again, don't wanna vary more than 1%. And then the other really important thing to consider about whole milk, especially as we head into the summer season where seeing uh, a milk fat depression is common seasonally, is that as your bulk tank components decrease, um, that's gonna have a direct impact on your calves because the amount of nutrients that's being delivered is also going to decrease. So it's not uncommon to um, start seeing calves that are fed whole milk, start having um, increased illness, increased scours as bulk tank components decrease if it's not being balanced and compensated for otherwise. So if you're opting to feed a milk replacer, it's important to note that not all milk replacers are created equally. So initially, um, 2020 milk replacers were uh, the first on the market, and they really were created to still meet the demands of a calf, but really to try and encourage early consumption of calf starter and to promote early weaning at a low cost per day. Recent research though, um, has really been looking at higher protein um, milk replacers and what that does for calf growth. And uh, we've seen that it really improves the rate of growth um, with those higher proteins leading to lean muscle tissue and frame um, growth. And so when you shift thinking away from what is my absolute um, cost in terms of feeding these calves and you switch to looking at your cost per unit of gain, um, it can actually be more economical to feed these higher protein um, milk replacers. And using these higher uh, protein milk replacers, the performance is really comparable to that of whole milk, which when you look at whole milk on a um, dry total solids basis, it's about 27% protein. There are some additional advantages that milk replacers can offer. Um, so again, getting away from the day-to-day -day bulk tank fluctuations, um, as long as mixing procedures are being followed correctly, uh, you can minimize that variation using a milk replacer. Um, of course, compared to unpasteurized non-saleable milk, you do have lower bacteria counts. And milk replacers also fit really nicely with um, disease control strategies. So specifically, Yoni's and bovine leukosis virus. And then lastly, um, as we discussed, uh, trying to increase and manipulate total solids can be fairly easy when using a milk replacer. But again, I said not all milk replacers are created equally. And so if you are choosing a milk replacer, there are three things to really look at. And you wanna look at the protein, the fat and the fiber. So first, when it comes to the protein, um, choosing a high protein content is really going to contribute to growing um, that nice lean frame on those calves. Um, and in terms of protein sources, opting for milk um, proteins leads to a higher digestibility and a higher feed efficiency. 
So when it comes to um, fat in our milk replacers, acceptable ranges are 15 to 25, um, but ideally we're focusing in on the 18 to 20%. And similar to protein, uh, focusing on fat sources that are coming from milk fats, just due to their uh, better digestibility, and it does reduce the chance for scours. And that's because when you look at um, milk replacers, especially the lower fat ones, so below 15%, um, to try and still deliver the same amount of energy as the higher fat ones, there's a substitution of um, fat for lactose. And lactose is a, a naturally occurring sugar in milk, but it is a really osmotically active molecule. So you run the risk of um, causing an osmotic diarrhea because the lactose tends to draw water um, towards itself. So when that lactose in high volumes is in the gut, um, you'll have more water entering the gut and then creating that osmotic diarrhea. And then lastly, fiber. So the amount of fiber is just an indication um, about the use of plant ingredients and a threshold of 0.15%, uh, either at or above that does indicate that there are some plant protein sources. Um, but even if it's below the threshold, it's still important to just read the label ingredients uh, and know what is in the milk replacer that you're purchasing. So another really, um, equally important part of nutrition that is often forgotten about is water. So water is really important um, for a variety of reasons. One of the main ones being that it's crucial for rumen development um, and it really does promote increases uh, in starter intake. So that water provides um, a medium for the bacteria that are in the rumen to live and also try and ferment the feed to develop those rumen papillae. So we suggest offering water by day three of life, um, which is similar to when we like to see calves offered starter as well. And then the other key to water, which is really important is the quality. Um, and this is especially important if you're feeding a milk replacer and that's just because you're using water to mix the milk replacer. So there's going to be quite a larger volume of water being consumed by those calves compared to calves on whole milk. So for the calves in our calf program, this is something that we do annually. We look, um, of course, at the bacteriology, but we do a full mineral panel um, as well. And so water that is high in total dissolved solids can create um, an osmotic scours. So some of our goals and thresholds is we want to see water that is less than a thousand parts per million. Um, and then as far as sodium chloride, under a hundred parts per million, 100 parts per million uh, for sodium and under 250 parts per million for chloride. And then there are also specific minerals that you really want to watch the um, concentration of and specifically that's iron, magnesium, manganese and sulfur. And um, we want to look at those four because they are either going to uh, potentiate diarrhea or actually increase uh, and support bacterial overgrowth. So lastly, in the three critical control points um, is environment. So we're trying to optimize the calf's environment, both by maximizing cleanliness uh, to reduce the pathogen challenge, uh, focusing both on feeding equipment and housing and then minimizing heat and cold stressors um, just to try and minimize the amount of energy those calves are redirecting away from growth. Um, in winter, that's making sure that we have deep bedding and getting a nesting score of about three. And then in summer, um, mitigating heat stress either through uh, shade cloths for calves in hutches or trying to increase air movement um, for calves that are in barns. So this was a study that was done uh, in 2006, and I, I thought it was pretty interesting because they investigated both nesting score as well as uh, the use of solid partitions. Um, and so when we talk about nesting score, it's um, on a one to three scale, and it's based on when a calf is laying down, how much of their legs can we see? So where one is completely visible and three is generally not visible. So um, looking at the chart on the left, of course, on our x-axis, we have uh, airborne bacteria. And obviously, as the concentration of airborne bacteria increases, 
uh, it's not a surprise that we see an increase in the prevalence of pneumonia. However, what was interesting was that um, there was less respiratory disease, both as nesting score uh, increased, um, as well as um, the use of individual uh, partitions. Um, so when it comes to disease risk factors, there are some that we can uh, control within the environment. So some of these stressors include um, poor ventilation, um, a lot of mixing of calves, uh, overcrowding and dust. And I think another important one that isn't on this list, but that needs to be uh, considered is drainage. So in uh, hutch systems, either having them on gravel or another um, substrate that really encourages drainage um, or in calf barns, um, thinking about having tile drainage under the, the pens is really important because not only does it keep the bedding drier, but it really reduces the ammonia levels, um, which helps support a uh, healthy respiratory tract for the calves and then minimizes um, the opportunity for disease. So when looking at those stressors, um, when it comes to ventilation um, in winter, we certainly do not want to draft the calves. Uh, we want to opt for four air exchanges per hour. And then in summer, we want to increase air movement. So we're looking um, to increase it to 40 air exchanges per hour. Minimizing mixing. So ideally, we're trying to fill pens within a seven day time span. This really um, isn't always possible in our Ontario and Canadian sized operations. Um, so what I would offer um, as another suggestion is trying to focus on your age grouping. So having calves that are zero to 21 days together and then calves that are 21 days um, and older together instead. So minimize crowding. Um, we like to see at least 35 square feet uh, per calf. And then minimizing dust. So choosing low dust beddings um, in winter, straw in summer, perhaps moving to something like a sand, which um, is a low dust bedding, but also does uh, provide the benefit of drawing heat away from the calf. So it does keep them cooler and can help with um, managing fly populations as well. Uh, and there was um, a study that also looked at calves and the amount um, of dust. And those farms that reported having um, lower dust also had um, almost half the proportion of pneumonia in calves as well. And so when it comes to cleanliness um, for minimizing our pathogen loads, this is something that we monitor in our calf health program. Um, as well as on our farms who are not enrolled. But we use a tool called a luminometer, which determines the amount uh, of organic residues and microbial loads that are found on the surfaces um, that we swab. And it's reported to us in relative light units with um, the higher the number, the larger the organic load. And so I'm not going to go into detail um, about the specific uh, cleaning protocols, but I do have these here. And like I said, I will make my slides available. But I think one of the important uh, takeaways from this is that we need to clean our milk feeding equipment in the same way that we're cleaning our bulk tank. So we need a uh, chlorinated alkalinizing detergent and we need an acid. Um, for calf feeding equipment, we also recommend that there is um, a sanitization step included as well, and we recommend a chlorine dioxide. But um, like I said, the main takeaway is that we need to be using similar chemicals to what we do for the bulk tank. Um, and in the same way the bulk tank agitates, that's where the importance of scrubbing comes um, for cleaning calf feeding equipment as well as um, calf housing equipment. So now that we've covered uh, the three uh, critical control points in terms of trying to control disease, we'll also talk more specifically about the pathogens that cause disease. So when it comes to scours, we can really break it up into three groups. We have our bacteria, our viruses, and our protozoa. 
So when it comes to E. coli, um, we, we simplify it really into um, two age ranges in which we expect to see E. coli affecting calves. We have um, one type that affects calves in the first week of life that we generally really see in the first days of life. Um, this is the E. coli that makes calves really, really sick. They're often hooked up to IV. Um, and without that intravenous uh, intervention, it does lead to death. The other E. coli that we uh, see, and there is an additional type called a VTEC, but um, that's more for older calves that are about two weeks of age. So E. coli would be our most common bacteria. And then uh, we also have Clostridium and Salmonella, which occur less commonly. Clostridium is pretty brutal though, because of the toxin production from the bacteria. So it becomes fatal pretty rapidly. Um, it can happen at any age in milk fed calves. And we do tend to see it a little bit more um, in milk replacer fed calves when there are mixing errors. So um, as long as there are no mixing errors, you really shouldn't um, be seeing it, but it can be a risk factor. And then lastly, uh, for our bacteria, we have salmonella. So affecting calves at about two to 12 weeks of age. And although we don't see it often, when they do get it, they're incredibly sick. Um, and we see in their manure, um, it's bloody mucus. And then there are casts, which are kind of just sloughed pieces of intestine. And then with our viruses, we have rotavirus and coronavirus. So we tend to see rotavirus a little bit earlier compared to coronavirus. So we see it mostly in the first week of life. Um, and on its own, rotavirus is something that can certainly kill calves. Whereas coronavirus tends to be a little bit less severe and we see it um, just a little bit later. So kind of after the first week of life. And then next we have our protozoa. So cryptosporidium is one of the most frustrating but also most common causes of uh, scours in calves. And um, we traditionally see it around 19, uh, sorry, nine to 14 days old. And it's not uncommon to see um, there be a co-infection. So also having rotavirus or coronavirus present um, as well. And what can be really frustrating about crypto is that it seems to last several days regardless of treatment. Um, but remembering the importance of nutrition, that is one management strategy that can help um, decrease the impact and the severity of crypto. And so lastly, for our scours pathogens, we have coccidia, which affects calves that are usually at least a month of age. Um, and then you will also see some blood in those scours as well. So I won't go into detail on this, but I did kind of break down um, by pathogen and then sort of how old uh, it is when we uh, see it in the calves and then whether there's blood and whether it is zoonotic. So this is interesting because this is the submissions that have gone to Guelph. And I would say that this is a really similar um, bug profile to what we see uh, when we do our in-house testing. But you can see that the majority of um, pathogens causing scours are not bacterial. So it's either a protozoa um, or a virus. So knowing that that's the case, it's interesting that when we look at how we treat our scours, that we often reach for antibiotics. So really those antibiotics should really be reserved um, for calves that are showing systemic signs of illness. So what do I mean by systemic? Um, looking at calves that are pretty dehydrated, uh, dull, depressed, uh, and have a fever. And so the reason that's important is because these systemic signs are an indication um, of bacteremia, so bacteria that have entered the bloodstream or an increased growth of E. coli. So even though our offending pathogen may not be E. coli, there can be a gut dysbiosis that then allows for an over proliferation of E. coli, which can make the calf sick. So we see this in about 30% of calves, um, but it can be in greater than 50% of calves when failure of passive transfer is present. Um, so not only is 
failure of passive transfer, increasing the proportion of calves um, or easing, increasing the risk to get scours by one and a half times, we now have um, at least half of those calves um, requiring antibiotic intervention as well. However, regardless on um, the pathogen causing the scours, it's really important to just focus on hydration and supportive care. So what I mean by that is having um, oral electrolytes being used early in the disease process and feeding that separate from milk feedings. Um, also potentially adding in a non-oral source of hydration. So an LRS under the skin with a uh, sodium bicarb buffer. And also very importantly, continuing to feed regular milk feedings. So you can certainly reduce the volume of feedings. And ideally, I like to see a reduced volume, but an increased feeding frequency. Um, and that's just so that the calves can get the nutrients that they require to fight the bug, um, while also trying to maximize the digestion of the milk. Their intestines are being attacked by the pathogen um, and being damaged. So the absorptive surface um, is compromised. So by offering smaller volumes, uh, we can still get those nutrients in without uh, overwhelming the calf's digestive system. And then lastly, providing an anti-inflammatory, uh, especially early in the disease process. Uh, I would say to try and avoid this in severely dehydrated calves, just because it can uh, cause some kidney damage, but using an anti-inflammatory early in the disease process is um, quite beneficial. So moving on to pneumonia pathogens, um, there are of course a lot more viruses and a lot more bacteria than what I'm going to discuss today, but these are the primary viruses and bacteria that we see in pre-weaned calves. So when it comes to BRSV, um, one of the important take homes I, um, I want from this is that BRSV both has the capability to cause pneumonia on its own, but it can also act as part of the BRD complex and allow for secondary bacterial um, pathogens to come in. And uh, in terms of a case fatality, it can be anywhere from zero to 20% of calves with BRSV uh, dying. So going into our bacterial pathogens, uh, Mannheimia is our most commonly isolated uh, bacteria, and it lives um, in healthy animals in the upper respiratory tract, but it's not one that we find uh, in the lungs. And it really is an opportunistic bacteria in that the bacterial growth rate will increase after some sort of um, stressful event, which um, could be just a variety of stressors or a viral infection. And then those bacteria get inhaled into the lungs and Mannheimia specifically releases toxins, which are incredibly damaging to lungs and it does kill calves as well. So pastorella is fairly similar uh, in that it lives in the upper respiratory tract in normal healthy calves and it's not found in the lungs, um, but it only becomes a problem once it proliferates and gets inhaled into the lungs. And it often um, just makes the pneumonia worse and it's usually involved in a pneumonia that's already been initiated by some other pathogens. So mycoplasma, um, a very frustrating cause of pneumonia. Again, normally lives in the nasal pathogens, but uh, sorry, passages, but not in the lungs. Um, but incredibly frustrating because it is what leads to those chronic pneumonias. Um, and when you see those calves with droopy ears, it's because of a secondary um, bacteria bacterial infection that's now occurring in the ear. So mycoplasma tends to spread through the blood and that's how um, it'll enter the ears and give you an otitis. And then it'll also create those large joints uh, on calves and get an arthritis. It's spread not only through normal um, infected respiratory secretions, but it can also be spread through unpasteurized waste milk um, to calves from cows that have a mycoplasma uh, mastitis. So we're fortunate in Ontario that uh, mycoplasma mastitis is not very common, but um, that certainly is one of the roots of transmission. 
And then lastly, but um, increasing in prevalence in Ontario and Canada is Salmonella Dublin. So traditionally, when we think of Salmonellas, uh, we think of scours and diarrhea, but the Dublin strain is unique in that it really uh, presents more as a pneumonia. So we see it most commonly in calves that are two to 12 weeks old. And one of the telltale signs is that you're seeing an outbreak of um, pneumonia in calves that seems to be highly unresponsive to antibiotics. And so one other condition of note in our pre-weaned calves is um, abomasal ulcers. So it occurs most commonly um, in calves four to 12 weeks of age. And it's actually a condition that more commonly occurs subclinically. So there are a lot of calves that have abomasal ulcers that we never even see or know about. Um, the ones that we do start seeing, um, they are, I mean, all ulcers are related to stress, but when we start seeing it, um, it's generally associated with higher cortisol levels, so higher stress levels. Um, there are a lot of thoughts in terms of, you know, what causes ulceration um, and some of the thoughts are fairly controversial, but trying to reduce stressors is one of the best prevention strategies. And I know that sounds fairly vague, um, which I think is another uh, frustrating part of ulcers, but some of those uh, prevention strategies really go back to consistency. So again, a consistent milk um, feeding volume and not too much. Um, so when I say not too much, uh, feeding up to four liters is for sure safe. Um, again, consistent feeding times, consistent feeding temperatures and consistent total solids, again, minimizing variation. And then again, not too much. So 15%, uh, when getting there gradually is, uh, no problem. We do start to see increased um, gastrointestinal diseases when you're getting into higher uh, percentages like 18. So trying to minimize that. And of course, uh, good feeding hygiene as well. And there's a possible role um, of clostridium involved there as well. So another important tool in the toolbox um, is your vaccines. And so this goes to uh, improving the host immune defenses. So there are vaccines available both for scours and pneumonia. Um, in terms of scours, there are the dry cow vaccinations. And it certainly varies by um, pathogen, but really we can see a reduction in disease and death anywhere from 60 to 90% with the use of these. Of course, we have to remember that um, because the protection is coming through the colostrum, we still really need to focus on those five cues of colostrum and making sure colostrum management um, is being done well. So when it comes to pneumonia, um, we have a lot of uh, intranasal options, which unfortunately is really our only option for calves under two months of age. Uh, and that's just because of the high proportion of circulating maternal antibodies that will neutralize any sort of injectable vaccine we try and give calves. Um, so there haven't been too many studies looking at um, the intranasal effects, certainly, uh, especially in the, the field. But in challenge studies, uh, they found that the proportion of consolidated lungs uh, was significantly lowered with the use of an intranasal vaccine going from 77% in unvaccinated challenged calves down to 41%. And then extrapolating from our available lab data, we could expect to see decreases uh, in pneumonia anywhere from 15 to 25% in the field and a reduction in mortality anywhere from uh, 35 to 77. So in summary, um, the development of disease really is a balancing act um, between the host, the pathogen, and the environment. And so we're able to reduce um, the prevalence of disease by focusing on um, those three things. And that comes back to maximizing our host defenses through um, optimal colostrum and nutrition management, as well as incorporating vaccinations 
minimizing our pathogen load and the opportunity for disease by minimizing stressors and optimizing the environment uh, in which our calves are living. And so with that, I thank you for your attention and I would be happy to take any um, questions that there might be. Um, thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, you certainly covered a lot of information in a short amount of time. So we will open up the question period now. Um, you'll see the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to click on that. You can type in your questions and I see that we have one here already. Yes. So Kristen, how do you go about getting your water tested for minerals? And what do you do if you have a high mineral content? Yeah, so great question. Um, so we submit uh, our samples to um, AgriLabs. Um, and then, so it, it comes back and I can actually even, um, I do think I have an example here. Um, yeah, that I can I can just quickly share um, what some of those results look like. So I um, I threw this into uh, an Excel spreadsheet just to make it easier to interpret. But yeah, so the samples uh, just get sent to um, AgriLabs. And then this is what comes back. So some of the, I would say most common offenders that we see um, is iron. So at that point, uh, just really getting your water specialists involved. So um, getting some iron filters in, uh, it really depends on what it is, but I would say iron is probably one of the um, most common offenders, which is, um, a pretty easy fix just by adding in some filters. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, next question, what causes a lump on the lower jaw in young calves? Yeah, so I guess, um, I guess it depends on what the lump is. Um, I'm assuming that the lump on the lower jaw, we're talking about that it's not connected to the jaw and it's still fairly mobile. Um, the lump that seems to be connected to the jaw and really like an outgrowth of the jaw, that's lumpy jaw, um, which is a bacteria that gets into the bone and is, is really difficult to treat. Um, and that can, that usually begins just from uh, a rough feed source that creates an injury and then bacteria can get in there. Um, so it's hard to say what the lump is. If it's mobile and separate from the jaw, then um, it could be an abscess, uh, in which case, again, there was just an opportunity for bacteria to get in through a cut again, usually just uh, the feedstuffs that cause that, um, or it could be just injury related. So it could be like a big blood, blood blister um, or a fluid uh, filled seroma just from injury. So it's, it's hard to know what, uh, what the lump is. Okay. Next question, should a newborn be standing while tubing or is laying down okay with head slightly raised? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> certainly I like to see, uh, the calf doesn't necessarily have to be standing. Um, if it's laying down, head, head raised is fine. I would just make sure that it's like on its stomach. So in a sternal recumbency, not laying on its side. So uh, either is fine um, and just taking care to make sure that you're in the esophagus. Okay. Uh, what do you recommend for treatment or management of crypto? Yeah, so that is a really great question because I think the key there is management of crypto. We don't have any available treatments. Um, in terms of management, it really comes down to um, making sure that things are clean, both the environment that the calf is in um, as well as feeding equipment. So being really diligent in cleaning frequently, um, as well as properly, and then replacing uh, cracked old equipment, because uh, we do get some biofilm layers that become really difficult to penetrate through. 
Um, and then again, as you saw in that study, making sure that calves have a really high plane of nutrition to get through the crypto. Where they pick it up is actually uh, generally the maternity pen. So that's another really important area to focus on um, in terms of cleanliness. In terms of treatment, so like I said, um, once calves get it, it's, it is self-limiting, it runs its course, just making sure that they're hydrated um, and then yeah, have a good plane of nutrition. Uh, I guess one thing that I'll add into that um, is that there is some uh, efficacy with charcoal and binding, uh, binding of crypto. So in the United States where they don't have products like um, halifuginone, um, which is the, the chemical name, um, Halicure is, is one of the common brands, um, where they don't have that, they do often use um, charcoal. Okay, interesting. And are there any, I get this question um, often on farm, what specific products would you recommend for cleaning? Yeah, so I think that's a, a great question. Um, you know, in a pinch, of course, you could use the exact same products that are used with your bulk tank. Um, we recommend um, a certain line uh, of products, which is uh, included in the presentation, um, but it's a little bit gentler on the plastics, which is generally what we're feeding calves with. Um, so those product names are listed uh, in the presentation, which uh, you'll, you can be free to share with everyone. Okay, perfect. Uh, do you prefer scour guard to calf guard? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I will, um, I'll lump in, in talking about, um, so we'll say scour guard, scour boss, which is um, another uh, one of the injectables and then same with guardian. So those um, are our three dry cow vaccines. Um, and then looking at um, calf guard, um, there are also other calf side products as well. So in general, I like um, dry cow vaccines because it is the only product that covers all um, four main pathogens. So when you look at any of the calf side products, none of them contain uh, protection uh, completely against Clostridium, E. coli, Rhoda, and Corona all in one product in the same way that our dry cow um, vaccines do. However, that being said, I mean, it is going to be farm dependent because we're vaccinating dry cows. That means your colostrum management has to be good. Um, and also your dry cow length also needs to be good. So there's a duration of immunity when we inject cows for um, how long they're able to produce antibodies against those scours pathogens. So if you're having cows with really long dry periods and you are vaccinating them at the beginning of when you dry them off, that's not going to be an effective management strategy because by the time colostrogenesis, that colostrum production begins, we're not really maximizing um, our protection against those scours pathogens. Okay, and this next question ties into uh, what you just answered, do you recommend the use of scour boluses? Um, yeah, absolutely. So I'm going, or sorry, scour boluses, I guess the clarification would be, are you talking about um, like the antibiotic scour bolus or are you talking about um, like a first defense scour prevention bolus? Um, I can certainly talk to both. Um, so in the same way, you know, a scour, uh, sorry, a calf guard, um, those other boluses to prevent, um, prevent scours, I certainly do recommend. I don't think you need to use both um, a dry cow vaccine and um, a bolus. It's sort of one or the other, whatever fits your management strategies best. Um, and then in terms of like a scour bolus uh, from the antibiotic, um, standpoint. So again, going back to knowing that we really only need to treat calves with systemic signs of illness, and that's usually due to an overgrowth of E. coli. I do actually prefer, um, an injectable, um, an injectable antibiotic in that case, um, just because we can, uh, 
yeah, better target the pathogen with a little bit less of an impact on the gut than directly delivering those antibiotics to the gut. Okay. Okay, and we're, we should wrap up soon. We'll um, answer one more question. Do you suggest tubing the second feeding of colostrum if the calf drank the first feeding but has no interest in more eight to 12 hours later? Yeah, that, that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, when you look at the data, um, the recommendation is, yeah, four liters in the first feeding for a Holstein three, if, if you're a Jersey, and then trying to get two more liters um, into the calves, you know, within 12 hours. So the answer would be, in terms of calf health, it's, it's going to be beneficial. Um, so would I recommend it? Um, I guess yes, um, but it depends. I mean, the literature says um, calves do benefit from that, but I think that, yeah, there are pros and cons. Okay. Is it better to wait and then offer them the third feeding or would you suggest the first two feedings and then let them skip that third feeding? Yeah, so that's also a great question. So when we look at gut closure in calves, um, we know, yeah, it really begins to close once, um, you know, they ingest the first thing, which hopefully is colostrum. Sometimes, you know, it might be manure or bedding if they're, if they're born overnight. Um, but the sooner that we can get that colostrum into them, so the first two feedings would be more important than the third for sure. Okay. All right. So if we didn't get to your questions, we will follow up via email, uh, but we hope that everyone enjoyed today's presentation. Thank you so much, Kristen, for taking the time uh, to give us your insight on calf health and diseases. It was very informative. I think we all learned a lot. Um, and thank you to everyone for attending. So with that, uh, we will close out this session. Thanks, Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye.